Hi everyone. In this video, I'm going to provide a short demonstration of confirmatory factor analysis using M+. Before we get started, let me note that you can obtain a copy of the data file that I will be working from at this link right here, and I will make it available underneath the video description. Uh, the file is actually called cfamd1.dat, so that's what you would be downloading if you go to that file. So, um, secondly, the uh, the uh, text file that I have open and that I'm going to be uh, essentially working from will also be made available as a link underneath the video description. So be sure to download that to follow along. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, basically, I'm going to run two models uh, with my data set. The first model is just going to be a basic two-factor model uh, where we are going to be using uh, these variables right here and these variables right here as indicators of two latent constructs. The second model is going to be the same uh, basic model but adding in correlated errors between uh, two of our indicator variables. So let's talk a little bit about the command structure. First, you'll see um, for this first model I've got a title command followed by a colon and then I basically just have the title of my analysis. Uh, and then you can see I've got a little uh, semicolon at the end right here. The next line, you can see it says data, colon, and then it says file is. And so everything after that is going to point the way to the uh, data file uh, for my analysis. And that data file does not contain variable names in it. So um, we unfortunately, there's no direct way to uh, import a data file that contains the, the variable names. So you basically are going to have to uh, import it um, without. So at any rate, uh, just kind of keep in mind that uh, this is essentially the path all the way through to that particular data file uh, that you see right here. So um, I actually have this data file saved underneath my downloads folder, uh, which is on my drive C. And so that's the pathway to this particular data file. You'll notice that I end with a semicolon. And that's one of the things to keep in mind is that you need to end each uh, set of commands with a semicolon. So on the next line, you'll see it's got variable and a colon. And, and so then I've got names R. And this is giving the names uh, for the variables that are in the data file. So you can see right here I've got preg1, preg2, preg3, contact1, contact2, contact3. I then continue on the next line with int angst1, intergroup anxiety2, and intergroup anxiety3, basically. And then we have a semicolon here. So notice that I don't have a semicolon on this line because I wanted to continue it uh, with the, the next line. And so the semicolon is essentially establishing uh, another breakpoint um, in my uh, commands. And so basically the variable names as they are appearing in this section are, um, are basically in the same order as the variables as they appear in that data file. And uh, by the way, if you're curious about what the data file looks like, this is it right here. So you can see I don't have variable names at the top. Um, it's basically set up in fixed uh, format. Basically, you can see that this is where the first uh, set of observations start and so forth. So this is basically the PREG1, PREG2, PREG3, CONTACT1, CONTACT2, CONTACT3, uh, intergroup anxiety 1, 2, and 3. So that's how it's set up. Now on the next line, you can see that it says use variables R. So basically it's like this. If you want uh, to use just a subset of the variables that are contained in your data set, then you need to specify what the variables are. And so in this case, I've got preg1 dash contact three. And so basically what this is, this is sort of a shorthand for saying I want all of these variables uh, to be included in the analysis. So you do have to specify which variables are going to be included in the analysis. If I didn't want um, to include the contact variables, but I wanted to include the uh, intergroup anxiety variables, then I probably would have just spelled out PREG1, PREG2, PREG3, then uh, intergroup anxiety 1, 2, and 3 uh, instead of what we have right here. Now on the next line, you can also see that I've got, it says missing R, all, and then I've got inside parenthesis 999. And the 999 is the missing value code that I have uh, set up in the uh, uh, DAT file. So this is basically instructing the program to recognize uh, any observation with the value of 999 as uh, essentially missing. 
So you can see that that's uh, appearing in um, parentheses there. Then we have a, a semicolon again. Now on the next line is a model. So we have model, then a colon, and then you can see we've got prejudice by preg1 to preg3, and then a semicolon. And that's essentially laying out uh, basically a latent variable uh, that's called prejudice uh, with indicators of uh, being the prejudice, preg1 to preg3 uh, variables. Then we have uh, contact, that's a latent variable, by then contact 1 to contact 3, and then a semicolon right there. So we have two latent uh, constructs. We have a measure of uh, prejudice, a measure of uh, intergroup contact. And then on the next line, we have output. And I, in this case, output colon. And then I, what I'm asking for right here are standardized um, factor loading. So basically, I wanted to not only end up with uh, unstandardized loadings, but also standardized loadings. And so that's why I put in uh, STDYX and then the semicolon there. So basically, we're going to be running a two-factor model with a measure of uh, prejudicial attitudes and uh, intergroup contact. Those are uh, basically the latent factors, and we have uh, three indicators of both. So let's go ahead and run an analysis. I'm actually just going to highlight all of this and copy it and then run the analysis in uh, M+. So I'm going to go up here to where it says File, and I'm going to click on New right here. And so I'm going to paste this in. So you can type this in directly. I'll be honest, I tend to prefer um, running, uh, basically typing things up in the text file and then pasting them in. Um, I, that's just kind of how I end up doing it. So at any rate, this is all of the code that we're going to be working from. So uh, at this point, we're going to click on Run M+. And you'll say, see it says Save Changes to uh, a, a Text File. And so the answer is going to always be pretty much yes. And I'm going to save over this one right here that was done previously. But uh, otherwise, it would just basically create a new text file. And, and then any subsequent analysis, you could just resave over it if you wanted. Um, but at any rate, here's the, the output. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit. And you can see uh, you know, number of observations and, and various uh, in indicators related to the model itself. You can see that the observed dependent variables, uh, these are the preg1 to preg3 variables and contact1 to contact3 variables. Estimator is maximum likelihood. Uh, as we scroll down, you get um, you know, proportion of data present right here. And then you also get uh, univariate sample statistics. So basically, you get the means and variances, uh, skewness and kurtosis, all of that good stuff. And then scroll down a little bit further, and then you get to the model fit indices. So the first uh, index that you have right here is the chi-square uh, goodness of fit test. This is the chi-square value. Uh, there's the degrees of freedom and the p-value. And historically, a non-significant chi-square value would be treated as an indicator of good model fit. But we also know that the chi-square test is impacted by sample size. And um, so, uh, so a lot of times, given that uh, SEM uh, models tend to uh, essentially involve large samples, this test result will oftentimes be uh, significant, which might be considered uh, as an indicator of poor fit. But given the fact that it is impacted by sample size, nowadays we use a lot more uh, sort of descriptive indices to evaluate fit. So one of the indices that we're going to look at is the uh, comparative fit index. We have a value of 1 right here, the Tucker-Lewis index. It's also referred to as non-norm fit index in other programs, and that's the value there. And so generally speaking, these values, uh, you know, more optimal levels are values of 0.95 or above. Uh, acceptable values are uh, about 0.90 or above. So both of these are indicating a uh, good model fit. When we scroll down, we you can also see that we have the standardized root mean square residual and basically values that are uh, below 0 0.05 would be considered uh, indicators of a uh, good fit. So, so thus far we have uh, good indicators of model fit. Another index that we might consider is the RMSEA, which is the root mean square error of approximation. And so values that are uh, 0.05 or below are considered indicative of close fit. Values up to about 0.08 would be considered uh, acceptable fit. And you can see right here this value is uh, essentially zero, uh, which is an indicator of close model fit. You also have another 
uh, uh, you have a test right here um, of close fit, and basically a non-significant uh, value right there would be considered an indicator of close fit. So basically, um, you know, really all of our uh, fit indices are suggesting good model fit. Now looking at the model results, you can see right here the estimates column uh, these are all unstandardized uh, coefficients. So you'll see that uh, the first uh, item right here, PREJ1, has a factor loading of 1. And that's because the program by default fixed that loading to 1. And the same goes for the contact variable. And so uh, basically, in order to um, achieve identifiability uh, for your model, you need to have you need to be able to set a measurement scale for the latent variables. And so uh, with respect to the unstandardized uh, solution, we've set the measurement scale in relation to a uh, one of the indicator variables. And so by default, the programs uh, basically fit um, the factor loading for uh, the first indicator for each of the uh, latent factors to one. The so really all of the test results and everything are useless in this context. So the main loadings then to interpret then would be PREJ2, that's the unstandardized loading, and PREJ3 right here. And both of those, you can see, are significant, significantly related to the latent factor. With respect to contact, there are the loadings there, and then you can see we have significance there. So basically, um, PREJ2, PREJ3, CONTACT2, CONTACT3 were all considered uh, significantly related to their respective latent factors. You can also see right here, CONTACT with prejudice, this is basically uh, the covariance between those two uh, latent factors, and you can see that it's not statistically significant. When we scroll down under standardized model results, that's because we had at, we had used uh, the STDYX um, option. Uh, then basically down here, you can see that these would be the standardized loadings. And so in this case, you do end up with a a standardized factor loading for prejudice one and uh, for contact one right here, and that's because the variance of the latent fa the latent factors are being fixed to one, and so now we can estimate the um, the factor loadings for those two uh, indicator variables. So these are all the uh, standardized factor loadings for all of these uh, indicator variables that you see right there. So if we scroll down a little bit further, you can also see the contact with prejudice. This is the correlation between those two latent factors. So, um, and so we would interpret this the same way we would interpret any correlation. You can see that it's very low, it's near zero, and clearly non significant. Then, down here with the R square values, these are essentially reflecting the proportion of variation in each of our indicator variables that are accounted for by the latent factors. Now, if we want to take a look at the um, the a diagram of the factor model. We can go up to diagram, click on view diagram, and this is what it looks like uh, right here. So this is from the unstandardized solution. So you can see right here, uh, this loading right here and this loading right here, both of those are fixed to uh, one and there's no standard error that's being estimated. Uh, the remaining are the estimated loadings along with their standard errors that are appearing in the parentheses. You can see over here basically uh, variance estimate, variance estimate, uh, standard error in parentheses, and then this is the covariance and the standard error there. Uh, to the right of these boxes, you see uh, the estimated uh, error variance and a standard error for each of those as well. Okay, so now let's try a little bit different one. Uh, actually, it's not very much different. We're just going to add in one additional line. In this case, we're going to allow the error term for PREJ1 uh, to covary with CONTACT3, the error term for CONTACT3. So basically, all I've done down here is change the title uh, from what we had above here, which was Model 1 Basic 2 Factor Model to Model 2 CFA with correlated errors. That's one change. And then everything else is exactly the same as before, except for under Model. Now, I, in, in addition to specifying um, the uh, general factor model. Now we're also including correlated error between PREJ1 and CONTACT3. So I'm actually going to go ahead and copy all of this and paste it in and uh, we'll rerun it. And it says save, save changes and I'm going to say yes. 
And so now looking at our output right here, you can see pretty much the model is not going to change that much in terms of fit, but I'll scroll down here again and you can see uh, that you know there's our chi-square value right there, degrees of freedom. See it's non-significant uh, for the chi-square goodness of fit test. RMSEA is still basically zero. The test of close fit for the uh, RMSEA is non-significant indicating uh, close fit. Uh, TLI and uh, CFI uh, values are both um, are both one or, or a slight bit over one for the TLI. So both of those are indicating very good fit. And then you also have the SRMR, it's 0 .02, so that's indicating very close fit. So basically everything that I've talked about up to this point holds with respect to how you would interpret the unstandardized and standardized um, coefficients in the model. I will show you though that uh, in addition right here you know we have the covariance between contact with prejudice that's the covariance estimate and uh, the test results there's our p-value right here this is the covariance between preg1 with contact 3 so that's a covariance estimate and you can see it's not statistically significant if we go down to the standardized model results you can see again this is the correlation between contact and prejudice uh, again that's a p-value that's given and then this would be the correlation between prejudice 1 and contact 3 and that's the correlation there and clearly non-significant so we'll just take a, another quick look at the diagram and so in this particular case right here, you, you'll notice that now we have a double-headed arrow that's pointing from Preg 1 all the way down to uh, Contact 3. And that's because we've added in a correlated error between uh, those two indicator variables. So at any rate, that pretty well concludes this demonstration, and I appreciate you watching.